if you are sharing something to connect with people to some, and usually it feels scary. I found that the scarier something feels, the better it is that you share it. But if it feels like relief, like, okay, I've unloaded that. Like, like you would talk to a friend, then often it's done selfishly. It's done because you just want to get this off your chest and you just need an ear and you don't have anyone close to you to share that with. I'm not sure if this makes sense. It actually sounds really harsh now that I'm saying it. Really what I mean is that oftentimes being vulnerable on the internet is whatever you make it. I can look at one person and say, oh my God, you're talking about your divorce and that's a little much and you need to rein it in. And then I can see someone else like, um, what's her name? Glennon, Glennon Doyle, mm. Melman, Momastery recently posted about her divorce. It was the most beautiful freaking thing I'd ever read. So it can be the two same topics. So one person can share something and another person can share the exact same thing, but their, their intention of unloading versus connection is usually really clear at the beginning. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Marianne, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Yeah, it is really, really cool to have you here because I think you were probably one of the first probably 100 people that I interviewed when we started the show as a podcast for bloggers. And uh, it's cool because, you know, now you're one of our listeners and you recently wrote in and uh, I was really intrigued by what you're up to. So um, I want to start by asking a question that my friend Matt asked me that I found has been fun and interesting. Um, Can you give me three adjectives that describe your child, an example of each, and how all of that has impacted and influenced the work that you've ended up doing with your life? That described my childhood? Yep. Oh my God, I love this question. Okay, Uh, three adjectives. Imaginative. Definitely. I used to jump into my grandma's pool and pretend that I was a mermaid. Like I'd, I'd put my legs together and like pretend that I had fins. And I did this up until like probably an embarrassingly old age. Um, I lived, my house was like right on the edge of the woods and I would like go into the woods by myself. And like, I was convinced that I had like first nation blood in me. And I would like go around like collecting rocks and pretending that they were turquoise. I'd spend a lot of time alone. So that might be my second word is alone. Um, when I was, oh God, I was in fourth grade, I think. And all of my friends, this is actually a really depressing story, but it made me who I am. So I'm just going to tell it. Uh, so all of my friends decided that they didn't like me. I was sort of an aggressive child and I had a lot of opinions from a very young age. And so all of my friends, I was, part, I was sort of like on the fringes of the popular group. And at like age 10, they all cornered me in a closet and told me that they didn't like me anymore and that they weren't going to be my friend. So I spent most of elementary school and middle school alone. And so I spent a lot of time like traipsing through the woods by myself and making up stories about things. Mm. Oh, and number three. Man, this is a hard one. I'm going to go a little bit older for this one. So like starting in middle school. Mm. So I, I, I had crushes on a lot of boys. That was like my other thing is I would constantly had crushes on people. So I would say in love, like I was, I sort of bounced around from like one prepubescent boyfriend to another. And I sort of defined myself by that for a while. Hmm. You know, that whole sort of imaginative thing, um, I think is, is so critically important to doing creative work. And yet, I think it seems like something we have less and less of as we, uh, you know, get further and further into our adult lives. And as somebody who maintained it for so long, I'm curious, you know, what do you say to adults who, who lack it or are looking to reconnect with it? Oh, man, I'm still trying to figure this out myself. I actually, I just spent, you know, a week in the woods uh, on this big sort of women's summer camp put on by Stratajoy. And for the first time, it was probably about a year, I reconnected with that, like, very playful childish part of myself that I didn't that I haven't had for a while and while yes I do creative work there's always like a purpose behind it it's okay I'm gonna write this essay for x reason or I'm gonna help this client with x thing and to be in the woods and 
you know, swim naked in the lake at midnight or make friendship bracelets with a, with a bunch of like adult old married ladies um, was really reconnected me with that play piece of things. And do you know what it was? It was the unlimited time. It was that I literally have nothing to do today. I can just sit inside my cabin all day or I can go for a walk. And it was that sort of like reconnection with what feels good. Um, and that, it felt really liberating, I think is the right word. And with that liberation came a slew of crazy ideas. Like I basically filled an entire journal during five days simply because I didn't have anything else to do with my time and creativity felt good. So it's sort of taking away the purpose and giving myself the time to explore that, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. I mean, I, I think um, it just speaks volumes to the power of environments and how environments mm. impact us. And not only that, choosing to put yourself in an environment in which you manage to shut off the inflow of information. Because I think that this is you know, based on observation based on, on sort of what I'm thinking about for a second book is, you know, if you don't have an environment that's conducive to creativity, it's really hard to actually get creative ideas flowing. And often an environment that's conducive to creativity is coincidentally also one in which, you know, you shut off the flow of information significantly. Um, Srini, this is my whole life right now. So I am temporarily based in a sort of small city in Germany and I live in a big apartment block and there are no trees nearby and everything's, I live in Dusseldorf, which is this like very sort of gray, everything was built up in the 1950s, cheaply, it's very industrial type city um, and there's no nature around. And so I stay in my apartment all day and I work from home. My apartment's nice and there's like a big window and lots of light, but I'm in the middle of this city that I hate. I don't speak any German, so I'm sort of surrounded. I, I sort of walk through the world as if, um, like just in my own little bubble. Like I can't engage with people. I can't be out in nature, which is sort of like my soul food. I don't really have any friends nearby. And this environment, I have never been so creatively tapped in my entire life. And so that environment, like even, you know, going back to the U.S. for a week and being in the middle of the wilderness created so much in that five days that I haven't for months. So it's like that environment piece, I did not realize how important it was until I moved to a place where I sort of put myself in this little bubble and trying to recharge those batteries without it's like trying to recharge batteries without an outlet you know it's like my cell phone's tap and I'm like plugging it into those like battery packs it just doesn't get the full charge like you gotta plug it into a wall I'm going really hardcore with this metaphor here but you know what I'm saying it's like I don't without that creative charge I'm refueling just by myself and it's really hard hmm. You know, I think the other thing that was really interesting to me about what you said is this idea of, you know, most of the time we're creating with some sense of purpose or some sense of, of an outcome, right? Everything we yeah. do is so outcome driven. And yet, you know, there's really no business outcome that's going to come from you sitting around making friendship bracelets. And <laughs> I think the, the, the thing that's interesting to me that is people question the value of that uh, even though, you know, if you look at it, you know, I, when we had El Luna here, she talked about how IDEO is a culture that takes their play very seriously. Mm -hmm. And I, I, th I thought a lot about that. And I thought, well, that has nothing to do with the work, but that's actually quite telling. Um, so I, I, I just kind of want to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, I mean, that's I, I struggle with that all the time. But also, the older I get, and the more that I do this, you know, I've been writing for a decade. And so the more I let myself create based on what feels good, the more I can actually do work that does have purpose. So for instance, um, so I write, I write primarily essays and copy and sort of nonfiction and recently joined a writer's group thinking, oh, I'm going to network my face off and I'm going to get like much better at this thing and I'm, it's going to be great. And the first day I go to this writer's group and it's like, 10 people sitting around some dining room table in Dusseldorf and they're like, okay, everyone take out your journals and we're just going to, we're going to do this writing prompt for 15 minutes. And it was fiction. And I wanted to barf. I was like, I can't do fiction. I'm not creative like that. I can't do it. This is really scary. No, no, no. And literally the timer started and I started doing it because I had no other choice. And what came out was one of the best things I've ever written, like a 15 minute fiction exercise. And so I've been going every week for almost a year and have been writing a ton of fiction. I have no desire to be a fiction author. I don't really want to write novels. I don't spend a ton of time doing it, but it's so fun. And it's given me, a, I didn't do it with any sort of purpose, but it has given me this new appreciation for fiction elements in my paid creative work. And it's made me a better writer. 
it's helped me tap into that that place of flow, that sort of like hmm, that that trust in myself that I'm able to create something even if I don't have any idea what I'm about to write. Mm-hmm. So like handwriting fiction for 15 minutes, you don't hear the prompt until it's time to start writing. And so you just have to go. There's no filter. You're doing it by hand so there's no distractions. Everyone else around you is doing it. So there's that energy. Like I can't do it alone. But when I do it in a group, there's this like energy that makes me feel like I'm just going to go and see what comes out. And stuff comes out and I'm like, where the hell did that story come from? Like I wrote a story the other day about like a brother and sister boxing team in a circus and I was like literally I know nothing about that circus I don't know anything about boxing but this whole story just came out it took up pages and pages in my journal and it's just given me something like a new a new appreciation for writing that I never would have done had I just practiced copywriting exercises or principles that I learned from a book it's just it's a very different experience so you mentioned that you've been writing for a decade. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll come back to sort of longevity, which I want to spend a bit of time talking about. But what I'm really curious about is how your habits, your systems, your rituals, how has that changed over the course of, of a decade of being a writer? Well, I have some now, which I did not. <laughs> As like a very sort of like creative-y person, I sort of shun routine um, I, I think it's lame. And every time I've tried to implement quote unquote, like good habits, especially morning routines, I'm like, I can't do that. I hate that. I'm just going to like go with the flow. Um, that was unsuccessful, but I did that for a very long time. Um, and so actually just in the past year, since moving to Germany, where I'm very creatively tapped out, I've actually had to develop these routines as a way to make me not want to die. I know that sounds like really extreme, but by being by myself all the time and not having these sort of external um, creative charges, I've gotten super depressed in a way that I haven't since I was a kid. And so I've had to implement, um, I hate this this term, but like self-care routines in order to charge my batteries. So I have this sort of like uh, every few hours I have to do some sort of self-care practice. So in the morning, it's yoga. I do 30 minutes of yoga just by myself in the living room. Um, I do tapping, which is super woo woo, but it's essentially just like self acupuncture sort of. Um, and then in the afternoon I meditate and take a nap. And then in the evening I walk the dog. And so all these sort of like three sort of half an hour to an hour self reflective meditative routines sort of help structure my day. And while I used to shun these routines and think they were super lame, implementing them has given me parameters around my creativity. So by giving myself a container to work in, I'm actually able to expand a little bit more. Sort of like, I read this study recently, I'm going to butcher this completely, but that kids, when they're set wild in like an open park, they all sort of like congregate in the middle and they don't move around a lot. They just stay within their little container um, and they don't run around and play. But you take kids to a fenced park where the parameters are very clearly identified and they spread out and they climb trees and they run around and play tag. And that's how I feel about my creativity is that when I give myself a container in which to play, I'm able to spread out a lot more. Wow. I love that. Um, yeah, I, 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 the reason I asked the question is because it's it's one something I'm incredibly curious about because you know uh, the next book I'm working on is going to be all about creative creative habits, not just sort of um, putting an unmistakable signature on things. But uh, but yeah, I've, I've noticed sort of the same pattern. Like once I put parameters and rules in place, and you know consistency uh, in terms of, of what my practices are like, I I mean every outcome that I thought about and wanted when when I started started to happen. And you know what, like that, I say, I I guess I didn't realize like how important these habits were until I started implementing them and started being more productive and more creative and happier and all of these things. But sometimes I wake up and it's usually on a Wednesday, hump day really does me in and I'm like, "Eh, I just did this routine for two days. Everything's the same forever and I'm going to die and not have accomplished anything. Like I tend to get like that. Mm -hmm. And so then I give myself permission to just do what feels good. So on Wednesdays, my routine just to like break it up, I will stay in bed as long as I want. I will read my novel, no business books allowed. I will drink tea in bed. Sometimes I'll have a cookie in the morning, like a crazy person. And um, that sort of like freedom, like allowing freedom, like allowing, giving myself permission 
to not be super strict all the time has also been liberating. So it's sort of like a yin yang type of situation. Like I believe in the power of habit and it's really helped me creatively as well. But at the same time, when I try to get too strict with myself, I ultimately feel like a failure. So I do need to incorporate some room for flexibility. Otherwise I'll go crazy. So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. Wow. Um, well, let's do this. Uh, walk me through sort of junior high to high school to how you end up doing the work that you're doing and the story that has led to today. And then we'll get into what I want to spend the rest of our t- talking about, which is really this idea of making your work more personal. Uh, yeah. But, you know, kind of walk, walk me through how you get to today. Okay. High school. Um, nothing that interesting there. I did some stuff. I was a theater nerd. I had a very long term boyfriend speaking of like the love aspect, which, uh, kept me in a little bit of a shell, I would say, and went off to college, majored in women's studies, actually. It was one of those things where I was like, I don't know what I want to do. This is fun. I'm a feminist. I'm going to study this stuff. And so I actually found that really great. But when I graduated college, I couldn't find a job. So it was like 2009. It was like right in the middle of that recession there. And I spent about three months. I was a maid at a a b and b like a local bed and breakfast. And was just like applying to jobs, applying to jobs. And I decided I wanted to work in publishing. This was totally arbitrary. I just wanted to write, you know. And I was like, oh, this will be a good place to do that. So I applied to a bunch of jobs. I think I got one interview out of like 20, 30 job applications. And after a few months of this, I just said, you know, I can't, I can't keep doing this. I can't keep putting my heart and soul into an application, application only to have it disappear into this black hole. So I... So went to the library and I just like looked in the job hunting section and found this book called Guerrilla Marketing for Job Hunters. I highly recommend it. It's probably like 15 years old now, but it was really life changing for me. And I read it and sort of discovered the world of marketing and was like, oh, well, I don't really have to follow the rules when it comes to job hunting. I can do whatever I want. And one of the ideas in this book was to take out advertisements of yourself targeting the employers that you want to work for. So I took out I don't know, probably 10 Facebook advertisements targeting the major publishers in New York, you know, Random House, Penguin, HarperCollins. And I sent them to a website that was just essentially my resume and some testimonials from people. And that's how I discovered the world of the internet and blogging. And within two weeks, I had a job at a like a book publicity firm, which was sort of on the fringes of my dream job. I didn't get a job at one of those big publishing houses. But what I did get was a lot of press, which sounds sort of weird right now saying this, but I, I was in Time Magazine and I was on ABC News and Real Simple Magazine. Like, oh, look at this girl. She's using social media to find a job. And then everyone assumed that I knew how to use social media for marketing, which was a blatant lie because I did not. But a lot of people, including HarperCollins, ended up hiring me freelance to do their social media for them. And through that, got into writing and got into blogging and writing advertisements and Twitter posts and that type of thing. And so it wasn't, like I said, it was on the fringes of my dream job. I really wanted to write, but I I had been told my entire life, you can't make money as a writer. It's not possible to be a writer. Both of my parents are actually really successful writers. So it's funny that I was brought up to think that writers would always be poor. But um, so, yeah, I got into sort of the social media consultancy. I spent many, many years traveling the world and doing this sort of freelance social media. I ended up at a digital marketing agency. Um, And in that time, so I was sort of at the intersection of the internet and writing and travel because I was using this freelance business to sort of fund my travels. And at the time I was living in New Zealand, this was 
2012, I think, and ended up getting a sort of my dream job at this company called Couchsurfing, which is like the big, for those of you who don't know, it's the biggest travel network in the world. It's like Airbnb, but for everyone and sort of dirty hippies is the stereotype, but it's actually this really magical community. So I got this job as their social media manager and then relocated to San Francisco where I lived for a few years. Then my husband got married, got this other job in marketing at this big startup called Thumbtack. And sort of in that time, so like all of these jobs and titles are sort of boring because at the heart of it, I was slowly learning how to write for the internet. And I was running my own blog and I was writing personal essays for different publications and always doing writing work on the side and incorporating incorporating that into my marketing work. And a few years ago, I just quit it all. And I was like, I just want to do the writing piece. I want to take the marketing piece off of it because that never felt good. It was my container that was actually holding back all of my writing and all the things that I wanted to do. Um, and I shifted into copywriting and sort of doing some personal essays and I guess more personal writing on the side. Um, and that's it. That's the, that's like the whole long story. So it was basically in a nutshell, it was really marketing focused for a long time until I took off that marketing shell and just let the writing piece come forward. So I'm less interested in the tactics because I think anybody can Google how to do some of this. But what I'm more interested in is the mindset that enables you to be in a situation where you don't have a job and say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go out and do this crazy thing that I've never done before, have no knowledge about. And I'm going to read a book and try to execute something that I have no experience doing. Um, I'm curious, you know, is there something about you that you think enables that? Um, And, and, you know, if so, what? And, And how do people find whatever that thing is? Well, at the end of the day, I know this is going to sound super weird, but it's my mom. It's my mom's piece in me. She, when we were young, there was never something we weren't allowed to do or that we couldn't do. So if we were trying to do something, I want to climb that tree. And we try to climb the tree and we'd fall. My mom would say, okay, well, what about trying it this way? Or maybe if I would hoist you up and you hang on to that branch, you can put your foot that way. Do you know what I'm saying? Like it was very much okay, you failed at it this way, let's do it another way. So my entire life has been like that. If something fails, it just means that I haven't done it in the way that's going to work for me. Um, And so, and I also think that was sort of really solidified when I took out those Facebook ads. I had never done something like that before. It was absolutely scary, but it never crossed my mind that that something negative would come from it. I just assumed okay, well, if it doesn't work, I'll just try another way. And it, it worked so well. And people came to me for all of their sort of social media blogging needs that I thought, huh, okay, well, maybe I can do this. And I was 22, right? So like most 22 year olds that I knew were either traveling because they didn't know what they wanted to do with their lives or because I'm from Connecticut, they were working at hedge funds. Neither of those things really appealed to me. And so the idea of just being like, okay, well, freelancing gives me a lot of freedom and a lot of flexibility. So I'll just keep doing this until it doesn't feel good anymore. And now having, so there was a eight year gap between when I did it then and now and doing it now, it never crossed my mind that it wouldn't work because it worked in the past. And so there, there was that sort of like, yes, this is scary. I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to move again and I'm going to start a business. It never felt, I don't know. I just never questioned I never questioned myself if one way didn't work. Like the first few months of my freelancing thing, I was taking super low paying jobs and not really loving the work. So I just quit them all and started again. And the second time it really stuck. So that, I think just the idea that if it doesn't work the first time, there's just another way to go about it. That's the big mindset thing that's sort of stuck with me my whole life. Yeah, I mean, it sounds to me like you're raised with what Carol Dweck calls the growth mindset. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So one of the things really interesting to me about this is that you've experienced sort of outside success at a young age, you know, almost Brian Holiday like in that sense that, you know, you're fresh out of college, you get to experience this uh, success that most people who are fresh out of college are struggling just to like, you know, find unpaid internships type of thing. And so I guess the, the bigger question is mentally, how do you not let all of that go to your head? Like, how do you stay humble and remain a student, you know, realizing that you still have so much to learn in that process? Oh God, I don't. It's it. I think about it all the time. Um, I, I actually, I think about this often. There is a piece of me that doesn't love that I'm so ingrained in the internet because I've, I've been on it for a decade that sort of, 
I judge a lot of my success based on how many likes it gets or how many comments I have or yeah, how much attention something gets, which at the end of the day is not why I write. I write because it feels good when I'm writing it and I write for the response I get from people who say me too. That sort of like deep connection that you get when you're really vulnerable and I'm trying to not to not make attention the only indication of my success. And part of me blames my early induction into quote unquote virality in that. But then the other piece of me is so grateful for it because the internet is the whole reason I have a business. And I've been lucky enough to live in so many countries because I was able to support myself because I wasn't tied to a job. I met my husband on the internet, right? Like the internet has given me so many magical things. But actually very recently, probably about two months ago, I deleted Facebook. It was like a really big step for me. I was like, you know what? This doesn't feel good. I'm spending 30 minutes to an hour a day just mindlessly scrolling through articles about Trump, which makes me want to vomit, and articles about the seven reasons I need to drink apple cider vinegar every morning or the 10 stretches I'm not doing. That means I'll be crippled for life, right? Like that, those sort of like that agitation of never doing enough that made me want to turn it off. And that's actually really helped. And I don't want to say it's kept me humble because I, I think at least internally I'm humble mostly because I have serious imposter syndrome all the time, like most women. And I think a big piece of it is trying to actually step away from the internet has been really big for me. It's not really stressing about, I don't really use Twitter anymore. Um, and really I just focus on the writing, like the piece that feels the best for me is the actual work that I'm doing. And so the more I focus on that and the less I focus on what happens after I create it, the better I feel about it. Funny. I, I, so I may have said this once before, like, you know, I, I use the five minute journal every morning and mm-hmm. anytime I write, what would be, what would make it a good day? I could probably look past, look back at the last maybe 80 days and almost always less time on Facebook and less time on the internet is what would make it a good day. And, you know, at the very end of the five minute journal each day, it says, you know, what could have made today better? And I could probably say 80% of my en- entries are, I spent less time online. Jeez. It, it, everyone I know, especially in our generation of the internet, I, feels this exact same way. This is not an uncommon feeling, yet we stay on it. There is an addiction to it, and I don't know how to step away from that other than literally deleting stuff. I use the app self-control a lot. Mm -hmm. Like When I can feel it in the morning, I'm like, you know what? No. Turt, just shut it down. Um, And right now, what I'm feeling most, now that I've gotten rid of a lot of this stuff, I mostly feel anxious now about email. So I'm trying to brainstorm ways that I can just not use email, so we'll see. Interesting. Um, well, let's do this. Uh, I, I will share. I'll, I'll you know share some ideas with you about email. I, I, I think I have some ways to manage it. I still struggle with that. That's kind of my last straw. Is okay. How many mm. times a day do I need to check this? Probably not. I've realized I can get away with checking email maybe once a day, and I, I've learned some of the things I learned from Cal Newport have played a, a big role in that. Okay. So all right. Um, I want to I want to shift gears a little bit, and I, I want to talk about you know the main reason that you wrote me in and wrote in, and that was this idea of making your work personal. Um, mm. I think vulnerability is really interesting, uh, especially because, you know, you hear people preach vulnerability, you know, Brene Brown writes a book about it. Of course, everybody hops on, on that bandwagon and is like, yeah, vulnerability is like the new form of trust. The, the thing is that I think people in my mind, and, and this is my experience with it, you know, myself screwing it up is they take it too far. They finding that balance between when you're being vulnerable and when you're being a train wreck and how do you incorporate that into your work? <laughs> uh, because I think there is a balance and I, 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 you know, sometimes you go off the deep end and you're like, this isn't vulnerable. This is a train wreck. It should be contained to, to the privacy of, you know, your own home. Yeah. I, I recently had an experience with uh, someone on the internet. My husband and I were talking about it and it felt as if this is a person I actually don't know in person, but she had posted something super vulnerable and intense and it, it sucked out my energy. It felt not like she was trying to connect, but that she was trying to unload her burden onto everybody else. And that's the difference. And I, I don't, I don't know how to identify it better than that in that 
if you are sharing something to connect with people to some, and usually it feels scary. I found that the scarier something feels, the better it is that you share it. But if it feels like relief, like, oh, okay, I've unloaded that. Like, like you would talk to a friend, then often it's done selfishly. It's done because you just want to get this off your chest and you just need an ear and you don't have anyone close to you to share that with. I'm not sure if this makes sense. It actually sounds really harsh now that I'm saying it. Really what I mean is that oftentimes being vulnerable on the internet is whatever you make it. I can look at one person and say, oh my God, you're talking about your divorce and that's a little much and you need to rein it in. And then I can see someone else like, um, what's her name? Glennon, Glennon Doyle, mm. Melman, Momastery recently posted about her divorce. It was the most beautiful freaking thing I'd ever read. So it can be the two same topics. So one person can share something and another person can share the exact same thing, but their, their intention of unloading versus connection is usually really clear at the beginning. Does that make sense? I'm oh, not yeah. sure if that's, that's no, no, clear it, enough. It, it, it totally makes sense. And I, I think the, the funny thing is what I've found in my experience is that usually when you're unloading, it's when you're still going through something and when you're still processing. Like there's a, I think there, there's sort of phases of dealing with, you know, difficult things that lead to your creative work and there's a processing phase and it seems like the processing phase really you're not meant to be sharing whatever it is you're sharing. Maybe. I don't know if I agree with that. I think... I think mostly, yes, like I, I hear what you're saying on that. And I've heard that advice before. But sometimes when I read somebody else's process, like this divorce piece from Momastery, it was in the, it's in the middle of everything. She wrote it in the middle of everything. And it felt, vulnerable is the wrong word. I feel like it, that word has been used. It's like awesome. It doesn't mean anything anymore. It felt comforting to know that somebody as famous and popular and well-read as her had these doubts as well and hadn't fully solved it yet. It felt comforting. And so I think that you can share in the process, but I don't know what the difference is between, between unloading and between unloading for your own selfish reasons mm -hmm. and unloading as a way to make other people feel safer. And I just know that I know it when I see it. Yeah. Man, that makes, that makes complete sense. So I want to ask you about something else. Uh, you know, you'd mentioned that you've been writing for 10 years and I want to come back to this, this because, you know, 10 years is a long time like that. And, that that's commitment. I'm just <laughs> curious, you know, when you, when you started, did you have this kind of a commitment in mind? No, oh, God, no, I didn't, I didn't know what blogging was number one. Uh, and so I, I did it with a purpose, sort of like what we were talking about was sort of creative purpose. And I wrote specifically because I wanted to showcase that I was a good enough writer that publishing houses should hire me as an editorial assistant. And then someday I would work my way up. That was like my big dream. None of those things have happened. And those first blog posts are real bad. They are not good. I'm not necessarily embarrassed by them. They're still up. You could find them. They're just not particularly well written. Um, but I've kept going because it feels good. Like there's no purpose to my blog now. The readership is, Jesus, a quarter of what it used to be because I'm not writing about the things I know people are necessarily searching for. Like I used to write 10 twi tips to get you started on Twitter. Um, and God, that makes me want to die to think about writing about that now. And, you know, I just recently posted about depression and entrepreneurship and that was literally shared for, it doesn't, that doesn't help me get business. It's not out there for any other purpose than when I was first starting a business. And I heard so many entrepreneurs talk about their 15 hour work days and their, the fact that they never see their children and they never sleep uh, and they don't have social lives, that made me scared. And that make me, made me think that I couldn't do it, that there's no way I can run a business because I'm incapable of doing 12 hour days. I can do a four hour work day. And my income, I, I know this isn't necessarily relevant, but my income has only increased since decreasing the amount of time that I work and increasing my amount of self care. And I now know after a few years of doing this, that 
you can run a business and you can be a successful entrepreneur without working yourself to death. And I wanted to share that with other budding entrepreneurs because it felt like something I had wanted to hear. And so to answer your question about commitment, if I had stuck with my initial quote unquote content strategy to grow my business, I would have stopped blogging after six months. But the fact that I kept doing it because that connection piece felt so important, that's where the commitment came from. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think the, there's a lot of really important sort of lessons in, in what you're saying. I think the the one one of the big ones in my mind is to be open where to, to wherever this whole thing may take you. I mean, last time you and I spoke seven years ago, I couldn't have predicted that this is what would we, we would have built. <laughs> Not even, magical, huh? Not even close. Not even close. I there is a, a a little note that I'm looking at right now on my 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 vintage Pinterest board, aka my bulletin board above my desk, and it I don't know who said this, but it says keep some room in your heart for the unimaginable. Mm-hmm. And every time I've come up with some freaking goal for the new year or some plan for my business, it has never turned out the way that I expected, but it has only gotten better. That when there is a little bit of room to pivot and to make last minute decisions and to follow whatever project you're working on that feels really good, I know that's not useful unless you're in it, but when you're in it, you can feel it. And that's usually where the magic happens. That's where the really cool projects and stories and clients and quote unquote results happen is when you have room for that space. Hmm. Okay, so two final questions for you. Um, as a reader, I'm ge- or as a writer, I'm hoping and guessing you're a voracious reader. I am. Okay. Um, what is one book, uh, piece of music, or documentary film, or any kind of film? Uh, and you can name one of each that you'd recommend to our audience. Oh, God. Okay, well, I don't read business books, so this is not going to be business-related totally at true. all. Um, oh, God, this is so hard. Um <sighs> The book that keeps popping into my mind, honestly, right now, it's because it's my favorite book of all time, is Room. And there was recently a movie made based on the book, and the movie is just as incredible as the book. So I highly recommend that one. Uh, It's by Emma Donahue, and it is one of the most beautiful pieces of storytelling I've ever read. I cry every time I read it. I sobbed like a baby in the movie. And music... I'm going to share because this is, it gives me the same soul feeling that I get when I read Room, but it is called Divinire, I believe, D-I-V-I-N-I-R-E by, oh God, I'm going to totally mess up this guy. I want to say his name is like Ludico something or other. He's uh, Italian, I believe. He's a composer. Anyway, it's just like soul music and I can literally listen to it on repeat. And it is, if you listen to the song Divinire, it is... It's the sound that my soul makes. Hmm. Okay, so I have one last question for you, which I know you've heard me ask. What do you think it is that makes somebody <laughs> or something unmistakable? It is the, and I know people have answered it this way, but it's just the friggin' truth. It's the willing to forge your own path. God, that's so cheesy. But it's the looking at what, it's so easy to get caught up in what everybody else is doing in your space. Like as a writer, I look at other writers and I want to curl up in a ball and never write again. Like it's just, I'm not good enough. I'm not well-trained enough. I'm not educated enough. I haven't had enough practice. And you do it anyway. It's that sort of looking around and feeling unworthy and not good enough and doing it for whatever your reasons are, that your reasons are completely irrelevant, but the, the willingness to keep pushing on and basically giving a big F you to everyone who tells you that you're not doing good enough or you're not trained enough or you're not educated enough or you're not practiced enough and doing it anyway. That to me, when I see people who do that, it just, yeah, it's unmistakable. Hmm. Well, I think that makes a uh, fitting way to end our conversation. Where can people learn more about you and your work? Yeah, so I run a little copywriting agency called Ohai Copy, O-H-H-A-I-C-O-P-Y.com. Or you can find me at marianlibrarian.com. That's my personal truth-telling blog, mostly about my dog and my depression. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that.